Sup, you beautiful bastards? Hope you have a fantastic Friday. Welcome back to the Friday Show. Now, for those of you that are new here, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I put out videos talking about the news, world events, and then Friday, it's all about the conversation. Looking through the past week of reactions, comments, debates, and responding myself back to you. But before we jump into that, I want to talk about a story that tons of people were requesting. It really didn't fit into the Philip DeFranco show, and that was Anthony from Smosh leaving Smosh. For those that don't know, Smosh is one of the brands and channels here on YouTube that have existed on this platform longer than I have existed on this platform, which is, I mean, I'm a dinosaur in YouTube years. The two original creators putting out a video on the original Smosh channel, Anthony putting out a video on his personal channel, he explained why. He said being part of a large company, when you had ideas, when you had things that you wanted to create, you had to go through a filter. Even as the original creator of the channel, they sold it at one point, even though the channel is still doing great on views, you just didn't have the power. And I get that, when it comes to creative people, especially if you're not worried about, if you're, if you're not gonna be able to pay your rent, or if you're gonna be able to eat next week, freedom and power are more valuable than money. Example, personally, I respect money, but that's because it allows me to try and gain more power, create more things, grow, try and send out my hopefully still rational message to a sometimes irrational world. When things get in the way of that, it is a very bad time. And so he's jumping ship, he's taking the risk, and even if it's just publicly, everything seems good. And from this, a ton of people were asking me what my thoughts were on this, and I mean, as a consumer, I, I haven't consumed Smosh content regularly in probably eight years, but they were, along with many others, the ones who helped open the door, who helped blow YouTube up, where people realize, oh, if, if these idiots, and I mean that in the nicest way, if these idiots, also this idiot, Philip DeFranco, uh, can, can put themselves out there and they can get views, then I can do it. I mean, they helped lead a, a new age of entertainment. And while I grew more and more away from their target demo and I stopped consuming their content, I mean, the respect's still there. And on the business side of things, my reaction is to any YouTube couple out there, to any people that work together in a business setting that have to do a break up video. Take notes from how they did this here. Yes, there, there's still going to be a surge of dislikes, people that are angry about the situation, but that is to be expected. <laughs> Unfortunately, the, the weird situation that YouTube creators or any creator is in at this point is very much a mommy and daddy. And when you make these videos, you are essentially parental figures informing the family that there is a divorce. There's a separation. We still love you. We'll always still love each other. It's just people grow and they separate and that's okay. But unlike in a real marriage, instead of it being one, one to 15 kids. I know Catholics and Mormons watch me. How dare you, Philip? That is representative of some of the families I grew up with. Unfortunately, it's not just one to 15 kids. You are talking about millions and millions of people, and some people are mature enough to get it, and others you're going to alienate. But with that said, let's jump into the Monday show. Monday, we talked about the Trump Julius Caesar controversy, the insane doppelganger arrest story, Puerto Rico statehood, and the anti Sharia protests. On the Trump Julius Caesar controversy, Joanna JJ wrote, Regardless how you feel, they never said the man stabbed was Trump. He does resemble Trump, but people fail to realize most, almost all of our presidents are white men. It is we who assumed it was Trump. Well, I get the point that you're getting across that it's been mainly white men, but in the actual play, Donald, well, not Donald Trump's wife speaks with a thick Eastern European accent, and Octavia Caesar is dressed like Jared Kushner, where he's wearing that nice getup with the bulletproof vest over it. So it is, but it's not. But it is Donald Trump. And personally, I think the best way to talk about this is to not skirt the issue that it was. But, as James Patton pointed out, Phil, it should be pointed out that the New York based Guthrie Theater did a nationwide tour in 2012 of Julius Caesar with a clear Obama figure being killed, yet barely a news ripple back then. Then adding, is the story more about paper thin skin on the right to their demagogue leader? So I mentioned the Obama inspired version later in the week. I didn't know about it on Monday. And I did find it interesting that when I did search around the time that this was in existence, I didn't find any big sites complaining about it. Now of course comparisons like this aren't always apples to apples. The political landscape and climate are far different. People are more divided and things are more polarized than ever. As far as paper thin skin on the right, I'm more along the lines of Anthony Doss, what he said. He wrote, too many crybaby snowflakes on both sides of the line. Trump supporters are quick to call out the liberal snowflakes, but they completely ignore how snowflake whiny they get about anything opposing Trump. Everyone needs to stop being so sensitive about everything and grow up. And Anthony, if you'll allow me, I kind of just want to redline this comment. I think it's some Trump supporters and some of the liberals. More and more these days, people lock those that are against their kind of thinking into one specific extreme box rather than looking at what it is, which is really a gradient. We have the loudest, most passionate people
people on the outside and then just like 80% in between. We have to remember that so they don't Pac-Man their way to the middle. And I think just in general, I don't have a problem with this version of the play and it's not because I'm like, I hate Trump and I want him to die. I don't, it's just that the message of Julius Caesar is that the killing of Julius Caesar is actually horrible. And also because of the way it's being presented, it appears as art, whereas Kathy Griffin's thing where she was holding up a bloody head of Donald Trump, it was, it was uninspired, it was tacky, there really wasn't a message there. I also found it ridiculous when she tried to make herself the victim of that situation with her press conference, but the main point, well there is none. I think there's two parts of the audience and two parts of this country that aren't gonna agree with each other on this. Or they're a part of that elusive third part that think the whole thing's stupid and just don't give a damn about it. And then we had the Tuesday show. Tuesday we talked about the Megyn Kelly Alex Jones interview backlash, the Fefe Act and Donald Trump, and the UK election. On the Cafefe Act, Curtis Thompson wrote, do we really want to enshrine tweets on a website with the same priority as bills signed into law or executive orders? That sounds like hyperbole in the extreme. Well, comparing tweets to bills, yes, that can sound extreme, but the White House has said that Donald Trump tweeting from his personal account, these are public statements. Public statements from the president need to be a part of public record. Now, the White House says that they're already making an archive of Donald Trump's tweets, but I think that changing the law, it just makes sense so that it's updated in the digital age. Certain things just need to be updated with the times. The people that drafted the original bill, they could have never predicted everything that happened since. I think it just makes sense. I don't even think it's a bipartisan issue. I think that there are certain ways that people are overextending. Like the people saying that Donald Trump blocking their accounts on Twitter, that's a First Amendment violation. The lawyers arguing that case may say they have a case, but I just feel like that's petty and stupid. Anyway. Then on Megyn Kelly and Alex Jones, we had Curie in 24-7 saying, Congratulations to Megyn Kelly for picking the hottest potato in the whole basket. Alex Jones should have known the interview would be used to make him look insane. Well, Alex Jones on his own show in the same kind of area where he said that he also doesn't want the video to air, he said that he did know that she was most likely going to do this. And that's why late last night, Alex Jones actually released audio of their pre-interview. Sure, but wouldn't the argument be then in the show, because I've seen that as a standard Democrat talking point, I'm not saying that's what you're doing. Well, he asked for privacy in his family, but he didn't do that for Sandy Hook, and he didn't do that for the pizzeria. No, I mean, I, it, I can ask you about that. You know, this is not going to be a contentious, you know, sort of gotcha exchange. I, that's not what this show is, and that's really not what I want to do. Um, I'm, I'm trying to create a different kind of program. And it's fine, you know, I'll ask you about some of the controversies, of course, and, and you'll say whatever you want to say, but it's not going to be some gotcha hit piece, I promise you that. It really will be about who is this guy, and we'll, we'll talk about some of the controversy, and I'll ask you, and you can respond, and, and we'll get into the whole, you know, what you've been through this past year, and I, my goal is for your listeners and the left, you know, who will be watching some on NBC to say, wow. That was really interesting. I, I don't, I'm not looking to portray you as some boogeyman or, you know, do any sort of a gotcha moment. I just want to talk about you. I want people to get to know you. And the craziest thing of all would be if some of the people who have this, you know, insane version of you in their heads walk away saying, you know what? I see, like, the dad in him. I see the guy who loves those kids and who is more complex than I've been led to believe. And what's kind of crazy is Alex Jones is most likely going to come out of this way better than Megyn Kelly. Because just from those audio clips, his audience is going to hear that and say, well, he, she said she wasn't going to do a hit piece. Then she's out there defending her interview, saying it's all about showing how despicable Alex Jones is. She wanted to shine a light on the connections between him and Trump. And then the people out there that were angry at Megyn Kelly for normalizing Alex Jones and, and bringing him in and, and saying, hey, maybe he's not the craziest person in the world. There's audio of her saying maybe they walk away from this interview with Alex Jones going, hmm, he's a good guy, a good father. Also, keep in mind, we've only seen the teaser. We don't know what the actual interview is like yet. My money is on, she was trying to mislead Alex Jones so he would actually do the interview. And she wasn't really aiming to normalize and validate like she was saying to Alex Jones and more it was an exposed piece. Raptor Jesus wrote, look, I live not far from Newtown. There's no debate here. We felt as the community reeled from this disgusting incident. With that said, getting mad at Megan seems bass backwards to me. Get mad at the guy propagating the bullshit, not the woman calling him out on it. Jars Fury wrote, Megan Kelly is doing real journalism interview viewing someone like Alex Jones. Everyone talks about normalizing the extreme conspiracist, but no one bats an eye when murderers or other criminals are interviewed. Does that normalize murder by keeping the people informed? It's like we're arguing for censorship for things we disagree with, which happens a lot on both sides nowadays. And random fabulous commenter wrote, I support Megyn Kelly on interviewing Alex Jones. If people think he is wrong, then debate him. If his ideas are ridiculous, people will decide themselves. Stop trying to censor people, America. And that's really where I stood on this story. Like, I understood if people don't like Megyn Kelly for whatever their reasons and they just want to bash her. But if you don't like Alex Jones and you're bashing her for doing 
watching this, it doesn't make sense to me. It's like in the past when we've talked about uh, Milo Yiannopoulos and Ann Coulter getting shut down. They were supposed to have talks and all of a sudden, boom, big protests, sometimes it would turn violent. The shutting down of their events so they cannot speak and I don't agree with a ton of the stuff that is coming out of their mouths. But I think that they should have the right to say it. If they're going to say something that is truly horrible, ignorant, flawed, then let it be out there in the light of day. Let it be out there so you can counter it or shine a light on what you think is really, really horrible and wrong. You're seeing this as validation rather than what it looks like Megyn Kelly's trying to do, which is expose it. And as far as if it's going to have the desired effect, that will ultimately come down to how skilled Megyn Kelly was making this piece. Or as how some people are going to see it, how deceptively she edits her video. But ultimately, my main opinion here is I'd much rather everything be out there in the light of day. And then let's talk Wednesday. Wednesday, we talked about the disgusting Austin Jones scandal, the Alexandria GOP baseball practice shooting, and the horrifying Grenfell Tower fire. On the Austin Jones story, uh, which by the way, actually, before I going into the comment, a quick little update. Austin Jones has reportedly been freed temporarily, having posted $100,000 bail. He's reportedly on home confinement in his mother's custody, and he's prohibited from going online while he awaits trial. That said, to Austin Jones, if you are breaking that ruling and you're watching this right now, you disgust me. And if anyone watching is like, but Phil, why? W watch the Wednesday video. It's the first vi It's the first story. It's just disgusting. There's a reason he's facing 30 years in prison. That said, let's look to the comments. First, from Lobbin Bullets, who writes, literally getting off on how young kids are. All of the correspondence shows that he will continue if this doesn't get him. This category of people are most disgusting pieces of garbage. And I think that's the big concern, is he had that scandal two years ago where it really wasn't about the young girls. It was that he was getting fans to do things. And then, who knows how quickly he went from abusing that power difference to then using that on 14 year old girls and the number of times he had them point out their age like you know That's the key thing that gets him there. I mean a predator like this. They they just need to be declawed Akila Canada said I'm very tired of comments trying to justify what he did what he did was predatory He looked for girls he could easily manipulate and he held the idea of them being his biggest fan above their heads 14 year olds are easily manipulated and know very little about the world If he was a 37 year old balding guy with a mustache people wouldn't be so quick to defend him And that's the big thing here is while he may look young. He is a 24 year old old man. He's not a young YouTuber, he's a 24 year old man. And as far as the number of people trying to justify it, this is what I'm talking about. There is this ever growing community that is trying to normalize this. It is disgusting, it is horrible, it's abusive. You can argue that there's not much of a difference between 10 years if it's someone that's 40 and 50, even 20 and 30. Although you could also ask the people that were 30 with the 20 year old, there's a difference there as far as maturity. But then change it to this situation, 24 and 14. He was sexually manipulating someone who couldn't even get a driver's permit. These kids are still developing. Like, some of them may look like adults on the outside. I understand. We've covered those stories in the past where celebrities got in trouble because they were like, wait, she's how old? But this is someone that knowingly pursued someone that age, and regardless of what they look like, they are not mature in their brain. They have not fully developed. It's just sick to me. And I do want to clarify a point that, that people, like, they always argue around this. If you're someone that has these feelings, but you don't act on them, you try and get help, I don't have a problem with you. I mean, I still probably would not want you around my kid, but you're you're you're, you're you. But to the people that actually touch kids, they pursue kids, they they watch child pornography, which is the abuse of children, thus perpetuating this abusive cycle. You're one of these people that we're seeing more and more of. Some of them label themselves pedosexuals, where love has no age, or anyone else trying to justify it. I fucking hate you. We can have a debate where the net result is always you're a monster, but my mind's just not going to change on that. The reason I don't have a problem with most everyone who does anything ever is that usually their choices just affect them. If someone's gay or trans or whatever, the, 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 the life experiences I don't know personally and I don't personally understand because I've never walked a mile in those person's shoes, it, it doesn't affect anyone else. These situations involve people's choices with themselves or another consenting adult. Live that life, no one's getting hurt, love you. But in a completely different situation when you have these people that are trying to normalize pedophilia. They say, you know, well, stuff just happens. Those people, they're just, they're just wired differently. To me, that's akin to some people are just wired to want to rape. They're just wired differently. They are different extremes of a situation that involves abuse and victims. And while the sound of people defending Austin Jones was very faint, not many there, the fact that there was even one, it disgusts me. And then there was Thursday. Thursday, we talked about the Bachelor in Paradise scandal, Facebook gifts, the Mayweather versus McGregor fight, and the 
two bits of Donald Trump news. On the Bachelor in Paradise scandal, Karen Thomas wrote, it's hard to assign blame to a party without seeing the video. All of this is speculation at this point. That being said, acting flirty, sexy, even being quote, a slut, does not take away anyone's right to safety and definitely not make an excuse for anyone to ignore a situation involving a lack of consent. And Karen, I 100% agree. This was a story that for me was going to be a two minute video and then as we went down the rabbit hole of the he said, she said, and the, the, the public statements and the legal arguments, it became this very weird monster of a story. For those of you that have watched the show for a while, you know that I'm not a white nighter. But consent is a very real issue and I feel like a lot of people use people's past against them. And there's a footage of a model who's done topless before or a porn star and something leaks of theirs where they didn't, they didn't grant permission, they had their choice stripped away, something that they didn't give out publicly is then shared with the world. A lot of people go, well, we've, we've already seen it. And to a different extreme, if there's a girl that sleeps around a lot, but then there's another time where she she's blackout drunk, she is just not there. It doesn't give anyone the right to go, she'd probably be fine with it. That said, as you pointed out, so much of this story is speculation. Unnamed sources saying things behind the scenes and you don't know who has what motive to say what. And that was a big reason why the question for this story and the main point of the story was public perception. Evidence versus slut shaming, what's what? We do know the video is being looked through, it's being investigated, we will hopefully know very soon what happened. And ultimately for me right now, it is a waiting game. Warner Bros said that they are investigating the situation. They have and they're investigating the tape of the incident. With how much money is at stake, how big these franchises are, I, for some reason, I feel like they're going to look at whoever is responsible here and they are going to go at them. I feel like if there are producers in the wrong, they are going to scorch earth them to make good. If it turns out Corinne was fine and she made up the story because she didn't want her boyfriend or whatever reason to find out, she's done. We're gonna have to wait and see. Then let's look at a few more and kind of give a final note. Kate7501 said she did something slutty while drunk and it was on camera. She regrets it and doesn't want footage to be released so claims rape. If she was sober and consented and then later regretted, it wouldn't be rape. But just because both of them are drunk and then somehow becomes rape when they regret it. Moonstar writes, she's blaming the show, she's traumatized? How can you blame others for your decision to intoxicate yourself and then initiate sexual acts? Is this woman an adult or what? Badget Vido wrote, sounds to me like it started as very drunk canoodling. She passed out at some indeterminate point and both he, the crew, and the cameras were unable to determine when. Doesn't sound malicious at all to me, just stupid. All right, so the first thing I wanna hit on here would be the Moonstar comment. How can you blame others for your decision to intoxicate yourself? Now, I understand the thinking here. You're a grown ass person, you should be responsible for yourself. But as someone who has passed out, two to three times in his entire lifetime on this planet, I, I don't think that me passing out because I accidentally drank too much gives anyone permission to have sex with me. Man or woman, my bad decision making shouldn't open me up for someone to be allowed to do something that is technically illegal. And while everyone can say what they want about Corinne, at this time, she's not actually attacking the guy that she messed around with. She's going after the production company, which for some people is gonna be like, okay, well, so she's going after the money. Whereas other people see it as, I signed up to be on a reality show. I. I the whole thing here was that we're gonna have you get drunk, we're gonna have fun. I assumed that the producers would make sure that I was safe. I wanted to be sloppy, it would make for great television, but if it went too far, I knew that you guys would just like push me in my room. So the main thing, I get what you're saying, I get why you're saying it, but I, I do personally believe that that general mindset is flawed. Someone, whether they be man or woman, making a legal bad decision, that should not open them up for someone to have sex with them. And as far as the whole story, it's just a very awkward thing to talk about as a guy. Covering the news for all these years, I have seen the stories of when people People cry rape and it didn't happen. I see that, I get disgusted by it, but I never want to be the guy saying, I don't, I don't think your rape claim's legit. But I also can't blindly believe every claim because people have lied in the past. And when it comes down to individuals, I, I hate the idea of using someone's past against them, but some of the things people have done in the past reflect their character. But also those past actions aren't apple to apple comparisons to a rape claim. The past of getting very drunk and being very sexual doesn't necessarily equate to making one, like one of the biggest claims you can make against another human being. But also I feel like it's almost easier to have an opinion as long as you, you hold it back somewhat until we we hear about the video evidence. While there's still going to be areas of gray in the argument of what happened from both sides, there is reportedly video evidence. Video evidence that we should very soon get some word on. This story will need to close at some point, and at that point, you are going to have someone who is a victim and someone who is a villain. But it's ultimately gonna come down to what was on camera. And that's actually where I'm gonna end today's show. I 100% wanna thank all you beautiful bastards for another fantastic week. Thank you for watching, commenting, sharing, being a part of DeFranco Elite, and helping us fund this thing. Whoever you are, whatever you're doing, thank you 
you so much for being a part of this. And of course, remember, if you like this video, you like what I do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you want to watch full versions of all the videos this week, and click or tap right there. If you want to see today's brand new behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you Sunday or Monday. I'm hoping this is the first week we can move back to six videos a week. I'm sick this week, but I'm still trying to step up my game. See you soon.